Welcome everybody, my name is Joost Damen. I'm an interventional cardiologist from the Erasmus University Medical Center in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. And it's my pleasure to be uh, joined today together with Alan uh, Jeremias and Ziad Ali from St. Francis Hospital in, in New York to discuss with you how we can use uh, current practice and contemporary imaging and physiology tools in order to get the best treatment for complex patients with renal insufficiency. We will do that uh, guided by a case that our friends from New York prepared. Uh, and why don't you, Alan, start with, uh, with presenting the case and then we will discuss throughout the case uh, all of the individual aspects of the tools that we're using in order to get the best outcome. Thanks, Joost. Uh, pleasure being here today. Um, let's run the case. Well, what we're going to do is we're just going to play the video and then we're just going to walk you oh, through all the steps. Guys. It's I know. Wow. Well, you know, there's one, one guy who's looking good, the other has all the gear on, on so you can't see anything. <laughs> you, know th you know there's a reason. We wear a head <laughs> mask and a mask. Uh, I, I don't know time. what the purpose of that is. <laughs> so let me go through the case real quick. 60 year old um, comes in with pretty significant exertional dyspnea who had also an abnormal stress test with a large area of um, in, in, uh, apical septal and infraapical ischemia. His history is that he had previous stents um, in the uh, diagonal branch and the circumflex as well as the ramus. Otherwise, no significant cardiac history, but his main comorbidity is impaired renal function. His creatinine is 3.75 with a GFR of 18. So obviously, that's, that's a problem. And so the, the rule of thumb that we use at St. Francis is to have the contrast amount similar to the GFR, so 18 cc's of contrast is what we're shooting for. And so how we do this is that we um, um, separate the diagnostic procedure from the interventional. And so we did a low contrast um, diagnostic angiogram a couple of weeks before this procedure. These are the pictures. So there's mild disease, um, non-obstructive disease of the RCA. Um, here is the left system. The circumflex looks okay, and then there is this tight lesion, as you can see in the in the mid LAD. The previous stent in the in the diagonal is patent with a I say moderate instant restenosis, approximately looks like a calcified nodule actually. So we decided actually not to treat that because we felt the focus was the uh, was the mid LAD, and I think we used a total of I don't know 10 cc's or so of contrast um, for the diagnostic. What we usually do, unless it's an emergency, we take the patient off the table, we make sure the renal function is stable, we'll bring them back two weeks later, and here we are now doing the case. Ziad, any comments? Uh, great, yeah, no, so that's a great introduction. I think it covered some of the key points that we're going to talk about. And the key points were that the contrast volume to EGFR ratio of less than one is your absolute contrast limit. We usually separate the diagnostic procedure and the interventional procedure. And then when we do the interventional procedure, we use the information that we got from the diagnostic, don't do other injections. And so the staging has some potential benefit because what it does is it gives a washout period and we typically do about seven days. So the way we do this in this case, um, or in all cases really, is we don't want to repeat the diagnostic, right? So we print out the, um, the actual picture and then we go into the exact same view. We have a printout on the, on the monitor, and so we do all the wiring and everything um, blindly. Yep. This is the access. I'm sure you do um, more radial, I guess, in Europe. We typically do a good amount of femoral cases, but when we do, we do obviously very careful access, which is ultrasound guided, mm -hmm. as well as with um, the angiographic um, landmarks of the femoral head, as, as you see here. So why do you do that? Can, can you, I mean, with the, the, the one of the key purposes of the ultrasound is to know where the bifurcation is. That's exactly right. So w what is the point of the needle and the, or the... Because um, actually it's a great point, Joost, because uh, this should be done with a combination of fluoroscopy and ultrasound. So the ultrasound is really guided to determine where the bifurcation is so we don't stick underneath it. Mm -hmm. But then once we've labeled and sort of identified that spot, usually with some forceps, then we perform fluoroscopic guided entry into the artery wall. And the reason we do that is it allows us to do closure, right? Because you can't take a closure angiogram. Well, I guess the point that you're trying to make is you know where the bifurcation is on the yes. ultrasound, but you don't know exactly where you dive into the pelvis, right? Mm -hmm. With the lateral circumflex artery, it's more difficult to see on ultrasound. Mm -hmm. So when you kind of combine the fluoroscopic landmarks and you know you shouldn't be below a certain point, mm -hmm. you know you can stick above, but not too high. Mm -hmm. So you avoid, you avoid a high stick as well as a low stick mm -hmm. um, if, if you do a combination of the two. It looks like you're doing the... Uh Anesthesia already indeed uh, based on the fluoro, right? So not based on the ultrasound. We typically do that with the ultrasound, position the probe, give the anesthesia, and then do the stick. Uh, so there are clearly multiple 
multiple options here. Right, certainly you can also puncture with direct you know, ultrasound visualization, yep. 100%. And then, of course, um, I'm sure you do the same. We use, we use microneedle access um, to, to minimize the trauma of the actual puncture. So why don't we go on to the volume on the, uh, on the case so that the audience can hear the audio and then we'll, we'll take some breaks along the way so that we can sort of talk things through. When he yes, sees the bifurcation, right, right He's actually going to move the mosquito clip. This is a good thing about the ultrasound, right? It tells you where to do your stick, but it also tells you where on the position of the vessel you're uh, puncturing. So you want to puncture exactly at 12 o'clock and not at 3 or 9 o'clock of, uh, of the artery. So that, I think, is a big advantage of the, of the ultrasound, specifically if you go for a large bore axis. Okay, so that's that. I have actually a pretty good pulse here. You want to floral, Alan, and show them the mosquito that it's in the right position? I think it's a little bit too low. Yeah, we can adjust Let's it see. if we need to. So this is exactly what we're saying with the hybrid approach. You see, we've marked the bifurcation with the hemostatic clip. So what that tells us is the bifurcation is very low mm -hmm. in comparison to the, um, uh, to the femoral head. And so what we can do then is base our access in between the hemostatic clip and the mid portion of the femoral head. And that way we make sure that we're above the bifurcation and below the inferior epigastric. The puncture and use the two French dilator to actually enter the artery. Want to talk about what, how we do micropuncture access with the two French dilator? Yeah, so just to be certain that um, you know, we're, we're in the right position, we actually don't put in the, the four French micro sheath, we actually only take the dilator. And then we, we take um, usually a, a small you know, um, a puff with, with like one cc or diluted contrast to make sure the access is, is in the right place so we, we can close it. So there's a couple of reasons why we do that for femoral access. And the reason is the two French dilator, obviously, it ha if you do end up puncturing in the wrong place, the amount of time you need to hold pressure is dramatically reduced because the radius is so small. But the two French dilator does allow you to connect the syringe to it and take an injection through it. So you can know where you are with a very, very low profile. And a minimal amount of, of contrast of also because yeah. obviously it's so small, you don't need much to fill it. Here's an example of micropuncture access that we would do for all of these cases. Of the micropuncture, not the whole sheath. We actually do it for every case, to be honest, mm -hmm. right? And document where we are. This is the middle of the femoral head, so I'm pretty confident this is a good access. And, and as you know, with the micropuncture... It so let's talk a little bit maybe about radial versus femoral in this clinical scenario. So one of the reasons why we've somewhat stepped away from radial in these zero contrast patients is the potential need to use the radial for a fistula in the future. I mean, obviously this patient's creatinine's, I think, 3.85. As much as we want to delay this, there, there may be a neat time that their patient's gonna end up on dialysis. Certainly we don't wanna hasten that, but we need to be cognizant that that would be a major um, undertaking if if the patient doesn't have access, then you're talking about grafts and so forth, so it could be very complicated. Uh, and there is one study from India which actually shows that a repeated radial artery access uh, leads to the inability to use this for fistula mm -hmm. and ends up uh, requiring more patients to have femoral artery grafts for dialysis, which of course is a, is a bad thing. Yeah, and again, subclinical thrombosis of the radial is, is, is quite frequent. It's about 10%, right? Yeah. He's low. And so uh, you can see that in this situation, because the patient's been NPO, we're actually underhydrated and increasing the risk for the patient. So with an EDP of 11, we'll actually end up giving a 250 bolus. So let's talk about that. I think that's an important point. So every case before the procedure, you'll notice that the first thing that we do is we take a JR diagnostic or a pigtail, we enter the ventricle and we measure the end diastolic pressure directly. And the reason we do that is this intraprocedural hydration. Now, one of the things uh, that has been a little bit misleading in this field is most people are doing aggressive prehydration. Now, aggressive prehydration makes sense if your GFR is 60 or 55, but when you have patients who have GFRs like this patient of 18, obviously their filtration function doesn't work, so you're at really significant risk of potentially overhydrating them and putting them in pulmonary edema. We did 100 consecutive patients where we performed right heart catheterization and, uh, and diastolic pressure measurements and did a clinical examination of the patient to determine whether we thought they were overhydrated, underhydrated, or perfectly hydrated, or euvolemic, so to speak. And there was absolutely no correlation. So we can't tell 
when a patient is adequately hydrated. Mm -hmm. In fact, it ended up being a third, a third, a third. A third of the patients were in the perfect EDP range from 12 to 18, a third were under and a third were above. And so what we do is we do intra-procedural hydration here. I think that's a great comment, Ziad, and I think we do the same, the exact same thing in Erasmus specifically for patients in heart failure. I mean, there's no point in prehydrating these, these patients routinely. I mean, measuring the LVDP will tell you everything. If the LVDP is 20, there's no need to administer additional fluids in order to increase their renal perfusion, right? In fact, you might have to do something else. You might exactly. want to, you know, uh, put them on some nitrates to drop the blood pressure yeah. so you can drop the EDP or even diurese them. Yep. Or flush mm -hmm. the system, so you have to kind of deduct, you know. So in this case, I think it was a bit on the low side, right? Mm -hmm. So we actually, in this case, gave, gave fluid. And we have a protocol, depending on the EDP, how much fluid yeah. we give. We actually do the half Poseidon protocol. So I think the seminal paper in this area is the Poseidon study by Samjet Brar that was published in The Lancet, which showed you could significantly reduce major adverse events if you did a prehydration strategy. But in that patient population, the mean GFR was almost 50. Mm -hmm. And their hydration protocol is very, very aggressive. I just don't think you can do that in patients with advanced CKD, so we need to be a little bit more cautious. So what you'll notice is Alan is not using the injector button to test. <clears throat> the reason is this contrast, this line could actually have contrast in it. And so the best way to make absolutely sure is to use a syringe. Uh, so this is a critical stage, right? So you don't want to repeat the diagnostic angiogram. You want to engage without using contrast. And so what we're doing here is we're going to try to engage the right coronary and we're going to, Alan's actually going to inject saline into the coronary artery. And by injecting saline, we'll see typical EKG changes that'll help us determine whether we're engaged or not. No. Yeah. It's a nice tip, right? It's not, not something people routinely do. And there, there you do. see it, actually. Yep. The, other, the other thing you can do, of course, is especially when you do a procedure like this, the patient is heparinized and, and mm -hmm. we have a guide wire in the, in the guide in this case and then we just, you know, enter probe, the, a, little probe a little bit with a very soft, you know, safe wire. Mm -hmm. So maybe those two techniques can be differentiated. So when you're doing a diagnostic procedure with a diagnostic catheter, we'll really spend some time trying to engage and using saline. Sometimes we can't. And when we do that, we usually give about 3,000 uh, units of heparin, attach a TUI to the diagnostic and then use the guide wire to help mm -hmm. us find the coronary like the left main and performing adenosine FFR or uh, because it's part of the left main complex or is it simply a circumflex lesion and we can use a resting index? So one thing that we uh, maybe should touch on is the use of the injector. Now this is a planned zero contrast case but both in diagnostic procedures and in interventions one of the advantages of the CVI injector is it gives you an exact quantitative amount of how, what's delivered into the coronary. Mm -hmm. And you know, look, I mean, the truth is whenever we use syringes, we always sort of, it's five, but we say three, mm -hmm. right? And so we end up sort of underestimating. And there's an advantage to be quantitative in these patients, especially when we're having a quantitative metric, like saying we need to be at an EGFR to contrast mm -hmm. well, volume also, ratio. And you have the one. settings. So as, as opposed to just injecting what you think is right, you can preset. And so you make sure you don't go over a certain volume yeah. with each injection, right? So I think it's very helpful for that yeah. purpose. And you have, of course, the flush feature if you want to just inject saline, for example, when you're looking for where the mm -hmm. coronary is. So you have a patient here with the focal lesion in the mid-LAD, but an approximal distal territory is quite diffuse disease, right? So what was the first step here? You continue with physiology? I think so, yeah. I think what we did was, I, I can't fully see the video, but I think how, how I recall is that we actually first checked the circumflex also because there was some mild disease there. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to exclude that there was any I issue, issue yeah. there, right? So we wired both vessels. We wired both vessels. That also gives us a silhouette. Remember, we don't inject. We don't have any kind of, you know. So when you wire both vessels or even some of the side branches, you basically outline the vessels. You have mm -hmm. a, a metallic silhouette of the coronaries. Yeah. And then in this case, once you have everything is wired, the, the assist, um, um, you know, Navis catheter, the FFR catheter, allows you to very easily, it's a micro catheter, mm -hmm. so you can slide it on in any of the wires you already have in place. So very easily and quickly you can determine, in this case, the physiology measurement of the CERC um, and then eventually of the LAD. And, and the reason of to do it in the LAD is to understand the distribution of disease. Like you said, there's a tight lesion, mm -hmm. but there's also diffuse disease. So how much contribution do you have from, from this you know, diffuse disease to the gradient? Yeah. So that's exactly what we're doing here. You saw we created a metallic silhouette. There's a wire in the circ, there's a wire in the LED, and now we're taking the Navis catheter down the LED. It's gonna do two things for us. 
A, it's going to help us determine the pattern of disease in the distal vessel, like you said, was diffuse. It will help us map the focal lesion as we do the pullback and really serve as to how we're going to at least plan the intervention. Yeah. And it'll dilate the lesion, too. Yeah. <laughs> that was a joke, man. <laughs> but it's, this is a beautiful example on how you can use the navus, right? Because, I mean, it, there's a lot of discussion when you need a wire or a microcatheter. But in this case in particular, you don't want to remove the wire, right? Sure. I mean, you, 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 you don't want to use contrast. You pick a routine workhorse wire, which you can easily deliver, put it in the LED, put it in the circumflex, and keep that throughout the procedure. Exactly. Not to mention the safety of that wire, right? Yeah. Right? You don't have to worry about a pressure wire and what the mm -hmm. tip is like and whether it's going to bend. You're talking about whatever your standard safe workhorse wire is, make an exaggerated J, leave it in the distal vessel, and then you've got security. Yeah. So here you started with a um, FFR or DPR in this case in the circ, right? I think we're doing the LED here. Uh, you might be right. Maybe the circ. We did yeah. the circ first, yeah. right. which, was, which was negative, right, as expected. Yeah. And so here we go. You're, we're you're, we're actually seeing us. I mean, I think that's, yeah, that's look, the point, right? Yeah, but look, it takes two seconds. Right? Exactly. You have the wire. So yeah. it's actually one. Yeah. yeah. It's one. Which is not unusual for the circ. No. Especially when there's no lesion. Oh, 0.99. <laughs> oh, there's a tight lesion there. <laughs> <laughs> Even if it's a tight lesion, you get 0.98. <laughs> but again, it's, it's I think, good technique to just make yeah. sure you're not dealing with other disease yeah. and you focus exactly. now on the LED. Yeah. yeah, so you leave everything in, you exchange the microcatheter, put it on the LED wire, and take it distally. So you want to elaborate a little bit on the concept of the, of the Navis catheter, Zian? Yeah, sure. So the Navis catheter is basically a microcatheter, a rapid exchange system that's got the pressure sensor at the distal tip. So the advantage, of course, is that you're able to use your workhorse wire, you're able to quickly deliver in a rapid exchange way to multiple vessels, so the workflow is very similar to using a balloon, so it's very easy for people. And you don't have to worry about damaging the tip or not being a, getting a good curve on it. It's really very utilitarian. Mm -hmm. You can go in and out as and many times super, as you can. I mean, the other thing is super fast. Yeah. What about post-PCI? You equalize and you put it down, it's done. Yeah. Post-PCI, same way. And Easy. you don't lose access in a vessel that may be difficult to wire in somebody who you don't want to use contrast, right? Exactly. Yeah. The one caveat I would say, not to the system in general with physiology, whether you use a, a wire or this system, wh when you have a tight lesion like in this case, mm -hmm. and you do a pullback to assess if there's other lesions or diffuse disease, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to assess that because the tight lesion will kind of overwhelm the physiology. Mm -hmm. And so you might have to predilate this and then repeat the physiology measurement to understand if there's additional lesions. And again, in that case, the Navis is nice because, again, you, you deliver it in two mm -hmm. seconds. Yeah. So just to walk through the steps here, the catheter's at the tip of the guide. We've just done an equalization. And now, just like a balloon, Alan's just sending this down. And you can see a huge pressure drop across that very focal lesion. Now, remember, we haven't dilated. This is all native. So now we're going to be able to do a very slow pullback and see whether or not most of the pressure loss, as we expect it is, is in this focal lesion, and whether or not there's going to be anything that we should focus on in the distal. So there's our, our point um, spot FFR. Our uh, spot FFR is 0.49. Yeah. That's highly significant, right? So this is likely a tight lesion, which may be slightly overestimated because of the profile of the nervous catheter. Yeah. So, of course, we studied that in the PERFORM study, mm -hmm. which showed that the microcatheter does impact by a mean difference of about 0.03. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, one of the things that we've learned since then is that we, we're kind of, to be honest, moving away from the cut point. You know, is there really that much difference between 0.79 and 0.81? What we're doing is using the physiology data in conjunction with all the patient's symptoms, with what the anatomy is like, mm -hmm. to help us make decisions. Yeah. I think that's, that's a critical comment. And that's also what we've recently learned at PCR. I mean, IFR, FFR, initially identical. The long term may be slightly different. But again, I mean, this, this is traffic light medicine, right? I mean, that, that, that's perhaps not contemporary. We use imaging more and more, get a much better appreciation about the disease type, the diffuseness, and so on. So what you saw on this very quickly was a, a very classic uh, pullback which showed a, a very, very focal lesion with very little pressure loss proximally and distally. And then what we did is we went ahead and we re-equalized. And now I believe what we're doing is we're going to the diagonal. And I think what we'll do is direct dive us, right? We're not going to pre-dilate. One of the advantages of the assist 
Ivis is that it's extremely deliverable. We call it the no, uh, I think we're moving HD on with the, uh, microcatheter. With the Ivis part. So let's talk about the Ivis. Yeah, so the Kodama Ivis is, is quite an interesting uh, Ivis catheter. It's a high resolution imaging system which can uh, image up to uh, 60 megahertz. And the key feature is that it has a pullback speed and can go up to 10 millimeters per second. So recall, most of the systems conventionally have this 0.5 millimeter per second uh, pullback speed, which will give you 60 frames per millimeter. But when do you actually need that? I mean, it takes a lot of time. And with a 10, you can be very fast. You still have 6 to 8 French, uh, frames per millimeter. In Rotterdam, we typically use the uh, pullback speed of 2.5 millimeters per second. But again, then you're already five times faster as compared to a conventional 0.5 pullback. I'm very impatient, so I use the 10. Yeah. I like the 2.5 also. I thought you're in the middle. You're a five guy. No, I'm a two five guy. <laughs> two five guy. Okay. <laughs> I'm a ten guy. I'm like, let's go, let's go. Ah, for post, yeah. yes. Post <laughs> maybe okay, but no, before. But but this is this is th I think guys, this is critical because I mean there are not so many cases in which you need sixty frames per millimeter. Yeah. But if you want to carefully assess the distal edge, we will get to that later. In in case you want to assess a tight osteolaft main lesion in which you don't want the catheter to jump, I mean in those cases you may you may want to switch to 0.5 and just do a short pullback. And then honestly the in those situations Joseph we're doing a lot of manual, right? Staying yeah, really you, you guys do a lot of manual. Only for you don't you don't use the, the manual at all? No, just to get in and that's it. Really? Okay. Yeah. So let me tell you how, how we do it and, and why I think the manual helps you mm -hmm. in combination with the pullback. So the way we do it is that the first part, we, we deliver the device distal to the lesion mm -hmm. and then manually come back into the lesion, right? So we know this is obviously the lesion, we have to cover it and then go back distal and find manually our yeah. landing zone. And that's that but we do as right? well. That's that's and part then we, we synny that, yeah. so we know we're going to land here, so we have a co-registration with the angiogram, mm -hmm. either wet or dry, in this case dry, mm -hmm. but you can do it wet also, yeah. of course, if you inject contrast. And then we start to pull back there. Mm -hmm. And then we know, okay, also when you do your, f your measurements on, mm -hmm. on the device itself, you know exactly how long it is. Right. Critical point. We also do that. So if you go in, start the pullback in a segment that is as healthy as possible. And I think we'll, we'll see that in a second. Sometimes it's very easy. You want a segment in or a frame in which the plug burden is close to zero. But in some cases, it's, it's, it's quite difficult. And I think in this case, it's, uh, it's a nice demonstration that it's, it's not always easy. No. So you can see we set up the Ivis catheter in about a couple minutes. Yeah. Um, but the f you just demonstrated the flushing part and that's critical, right? Yeah. I mean, if you don't prepare it properly and whether irrespective of the brand you use, if you don't flush and prepare it properly, you will get air bubbles and uh, you will lose the signal uh, at, at the moment supreme during the pullback. So really take one minute to do it properly and you will uh, enjoy the benefits of the imaging catheter. If you just focus on the video for a second, we'll go through that algorithm that Alan just mentioned about going distal and proximal. Directly on the IVUS, there's a button that looks like a Wi-Fi button. I go ahead and press that, and he's conveniently right in the middle of the plaque. Okay, crosses without any difficulty. There's the lesion. So now the trick is finding a landing zone in a kind of diffusely diseased vessel. So what he's going to do is... This is a little bit distal. We're going to record on manual. So I'm just perusing manually the distal vessel to try to figure out... This is not bad right that here. That is not bad. Let me get into the lesion more, which is here. So yeah, I think Let's that's gonna be the landing zone. So I'm re-advancing to find that landing zone, which is right here. Just a little bit more, I think. So this is one option to do it. You can also put it as distal as possible and just do a pullback, right? Then you have everything you need. The only thing you will miss, and that is what Alan just mentioned, is you cannot correlate once you start standing where the exact spot is that you at least angiographically know that it's... But I think especially for the reason we do it this way, for a zero contrast, you can't otherwise co-register. Exactly. Because especially when you do a fast pullback, mm -hmm. right? For me, yeah. who's using 10, it's flying through, I can't stop on that frame. So this at least, uh, uh, you know, mitigates that strategy. And that's yeah. especially why we use it for ultra low contrast cases. Yeah. Here is difficult, right? It seems yeah, really a lot, lot of the Vs. And I bet you we, di we didn't actually repeat the, you know, FFR after dilatation, yeah. but I bet you if we would have, it would have shown that now the tight lesion might not be as, as much pressure loss mm -hmm. there, and then there's pressure loss elsewhere in the vessel. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you see how fast this goes, right? So this was 10 millimeter per second, so that's, that's 8 frames per millimeter, 6 to 8, I don't recall, 6 or 8. You do the so, math. Somewhere, you do the math. So, somewhere around we'll leave, that. We'll leave the uh, map to the uh, Dutch uh, guy. <laughs> No, but it's not so relevant. But uh, just to say it, it's, it's quite fast. And here you start measuring, right? So this is a complicated situation because there's no landing zone. No. So 
you know, these advanced CKD patients have diffuse disease and if you think what we're doing here is we're trying to optimize a bad situation because the whole distal vessel disease. And honestly, if we didn't look for the best possible landing zone, there's a significant hazard here. I mean, if you do this without imaging, for example, let's just say, you stick a stent wherever you think it's you, bad, you just you, do you something. Have no idea, right? And so let's talk about the sizing. So if we have less than 50% plaque burden, meaning a reasonably good landing zone, mm -hmm. we want to maximize the diameter of the stent, so we go by the, by the EEL strategy. And the EEL strategy is you measure the EEL like we do in this case, right, and you downsize to the next available stent size. In the case like this, where there's a lot of diffuse disease without a good landing zone, a safer strategy might be to go by lumen and then upsize to the next available stent. Yeah, yeah but in this case, I think you're right. I mean identifying with the true vessel sizes here in this, this, this occasion is extremely difficult. You find the lumen diameter of, what was it, 1.7 times 1.9, it's really small. But there's a lot of plug, so you have positive remodeling, so you overestimate the vessel size, right. but you also have uh, a lot of plug burden, which makes you yeah, simply not being able to, to do a proper sizing based on what you think should be the precise and actual vessel diameter, so it's, it's, it's difficult. But here you're scrolling around, right? So you have here 1.9, 1.7, small. This leads a lot bigger. Yeah, so I think ultimately what you have to do is maybe put a smaller stent distally so you don't, you know, dissect distally, and then make sure you use a stent platform that you can, you know, bring up to much larger sizes. So a couple of things are crucial, right? If you do the IVIS pullback and the first initial pullback, so first you find your landing zones proximally distal, but the second, perhaps more important thing is to look at the morphology of the plug. And you went, we, we just saw it went quite quickly, but there are no severe calcifications, right? So no. this is the first step in the imaging, um, which will help you to decide whether or not you need to do any predilatation, scoring, cutting balloons, rotor blader, and so on. Uh, here, no severe calcification. You see a lot of disease. Uh, some calcification here between uh, 3 and 8 o'clock, but you see the vessel border throughout the, uh, the vessel in most of the frames, which... And this is our proximal landing zone, so that's what we're doing now. Proximal looks a lot better. Absolutely. So. so here what yeah. we're going to do is just measure from the distal yeah. reference to our proximal reference and, and do some math and basically see if we can fit this with one stent or two stents. Yeah. You see a lot of superficial calcium. Yeah, as well, less than 180 degrees. So there's clearly multiple strategies here. It would have made sense, I think, to do some predilatation, give some nitrates, and hope that the vessel will expand a little bit, which so That's a great could, point. Could, it could make your sizing a little bit easier, right? Now, I think Jos makes a great point. So when you have a very, very tight lesion, the distal vessel is actually underfilled. And so when we're sizing this, we're actually undersizing somewhat. We know that when you put a stent into a lesion, 40% of cases the vessel grows by at least one device size. And the tighter the lesion, the more likely that is to happen because of this decompression. Yeah. My strategy here would be okay, direct fine. stent. So let's use a 2548 stent, and then we'll get maybe a 30 and a 35 NC balloon. Perfect. Now, so I think what Alan demonstrated was really actually very important, and that is... And then there's the discussion, right? Lumen, vessel, diffuse disease, so you clearly did not opt to size on the, on the vessel wall, which is also not, not precisely measured here because you simply don't see the vessel wall because of the, the, the disease and perhaps somewhat a little bit of calcium. Yeah, I think the strategy in the case like this, as I mentioned before, is to, to go by, by the distal lumen size, you upsize to the next available mm. stent, so maybe in this case a two and a quarter. But then, of course, make sure proximally it's probably a 3.5 vessel that the two and a quarter can be actually dilated to, to, to 3.5. One of the nice things about this strategy is that this now becomes more like a TAVR, so we're going to ask for all of our equipment up front. So we're going to take a 225-48, we'll have our proximal post-dilation balloon, we'll have our distal post-dilation balloon, so it's really a planned strategy. Uh, rather than sort of ad hoc asking for bits and pieces. New one. And what I'm going to do is what we're... Thanks. So what we're going to do in the meantime is just go across and look and to see where the artery actually gets to 3.5. So you can see that really quickly after this branch. You see this branch? And that is typical for us. 
So, Alan, you want to uh, – we don't have an angiogram. No. But there's a septal branch at which the artery suddenly tapers, and we can right. see it on the old film here. And so – what? Now, Just to point out one thing is what, what Ziad is doing is he actually took a syringe, he undid it, and he's using the, the inside, the, the black rubber of the inside of the syringe to on the touch screen of the assist. So this way we don't need you know somebody to help us. We can manipulate the measurements on our own. So what I'm going to do is just bookmark that spot. And so by bookmarking that spot, I can actually do a second measurement and say that we have, 12. if we, a t 12 millimeters from the distal edge is how far we can use a 3.0. So really, we'll take a 3.012, and then all the way proximal to that, we can actually use a considerably larger balloon. Yeah, so what you're doing here is to try to get a better appreciation of the true vessel size in order to um, determine the size of the pulse dilation balloon, right? So you pick the stand size based on the distal reference, lumen in this case, and then upsize. So make sure you have a stand that you can upsize to the desired uh, size and then uh, pick your pulse balloon. And, and upsize uh, aggressively, yeah. right? We, I think we, we might pick a two and a quarter stand, but we go in with a 3.0 you know, distally and then a 3.5 three five, three five proximally. And, and you'll notice how we used the Kodama here was we perused the pullback and we looked for the place at which it grows. Mm -hmm. And it usually grows next to a branch. There must be a large septal or diagonal there. We marked that and so we know that 12 millimeters from the distal edge, the artery goes to 3.0. Mm. So we can take our 3.0 balloon down to that segment. Now, if you really wanted to be sophisticated about it, what you could do is go ahead and put a wire in that branch to mark it for zero contrast. But in general, there's enough leeway within the stented segment that it shouldn't be a problem if you're a millimeter. Well, you also know, this, this was 12 millimeters. You, oh, you, you use a 15 balloon for post dill, mm -hmm. so you will have an idea if you put that distally, right, that you pull back one balloon length, more or less. It's a nice comment, by the way, on using the, the rubber side of the, of, of the syringe, right? I mean, this, this system is, is equipped with a touch screen. So if you have a nurse or a technician in the lab, that's very easy. But if you don't have one, I mean, there's a lot you can do yourself, right? Here goes the 2548, I think. Yeah. Store that still, no contrast. So here you'll see an ancillary technology, which is the Philips uh, device detection. And you can see how helpful that is because we can see areas that are underexpanded by angiography. And then we perform our post dilation and our ability to make sure that, like for example, using our 3012 millimeters away, we can see it with very high resolution. Yeah. You guys are fast, but now we're playing the video. Uh, no, no, in a higher not, pace. We're not. No, we're just that fast. No, look at that. No, I think you're wrong, Yost. Once we get going, <laughs> we're really fast. <laughs> This is, this is <laughs> it takes a long time to do all the measurements. That's right. <laughs> Hyperspeed. So you see we dilated with a 3.0 and then we've dilated with a 3.5 proximally. Yeah. Here, take your time to do the post dilation. So we post dilated. Now we're going to go back with our Kodama uh, post PCI to see what our expansion looks like and, of course, do the max part of MLD max. Look for medial dissection, whether the stent is opposed, and what our expansion is. Pull back. Okay, and then what we're going to do is go to 10 millimeter per you second. You'll pick this thing up. Yep. Thank you. So stand is in, post-PCI assessment. Of the stent. And then we're going to give a little saline to show you how you can differentiate whether you might have... Yeah, so expansion should be good, but then the edge is critical, right? We know there's a lot of disease this yeah, yeah, that's the question. So there, there is the edge. So what I'm going to do is take a syringe, right? So these are cases where I may want to switch to a somewhat lower pullback speed in order to get a bit of better appreciation. I think you're right, yeah. yeah for sure. Hard to see, isn't it? Didn't see much. Maybe we need to do one more. Fill this up, please. One other thing that you can do also to enhance image quality is, is inject saline so that the, the lumen is completely black, right? And so the interface between the lumen and the plaque becomes very visible. Here it looks difficult, right? I mean, you see the catheter, you see there's, there's likely not a lot of flow here. Right, so this could be a problem. 
That's a See, better... it's all diffuse here. That's distal, so why don't right. we just do a run from here, right? Maybe that can help. There's something going on. Yeah. Well, the stent itself approximately looks okay on this on this rapid pullback. Something's this, going on at the distal edge. This is, is a little questionable. Let's see what we did. I don't know. It's all... Go distal. Go to the edge of the run. So you can scroll through it. You can use the rapid review feature, which makes a small loop of, uh, say, a millimeter, a couple of frames. The, the, the lumen there is like 1.5. It's complete diffuse disease. Yeah, so, so I really don't like to put a stent there. If we can avoid it, that's there's no good. Deep attenuated plaque. So only consider a distal stent if you have a more distal, healthier reference segment to land. And in this case, that does not seem to be the case, right? Consider, yeah, I mean, you guys don't have drug-coated balloons. Could argue that that could have been a theoretical strategy in these diffuse small vessels. So there's disease. something yeah, going, going up here too, right? Proximally? At that place, we'll take a cine and do an injection at the same time, and we can delineate how bad that is. Okay. Okay. Yeah, right. But is the, is the IVIS going to be holding the flap back, you think? Tom? No, we'll be able to see it, I think. So you hear him injecting some? We're going to inject saline, like Alan oh. said, to help delineate to see whether we can see better by clearing the blood using a saline injection. Mm -hmm. Just with the syringe, right? Yep. Oh. So let me zoom up one. Am I out? No. I mean, that part looks great. Here it is, right? Come back a little, Alan. I'm just flushing forward. Come back a little. Come back a little co manually. Back a little more, more manually. C keep coming, keep coming. Keep coming, keep coming. Keep coming. Yeah, there's, a, there's definitely okay, so a I'm gonna go. So these are the difficult cases, right? But I think the only thing we can say for certain is that there is no healthy reference distal lumen. And whether there's a dissection or a rupture or, or some, some, some soft rupture thrombotic material, it's, it's very difficult to tell, right? And so, of course, one of the things we can do here is switch back to physiology. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's what we're going to do next is because we have this ambiguity, we fixed the proximal lesion and now we can assess the distal vessel. We'll go mm -hmm. back with the navis catheter and that'll help us decide if there's a focal step up in that segment, then yeah. clearly there's a dissection flap that's causing a problem. But if it's diffuse all the way throughout, then it might not be the same issue. Yeah. Well, the, the other thing also, I think, in a, especially a case like this, you can't be overly dogmatic. No. Right? The plan was to do this with zero contrast, but now you have a potential complication. And so now you have to invest a bit of contrast to know what's going on. And that's why we staged, because we've got 18 milliliters more mm -hmm. than we did last right. time. Okay. All right, here. That's the flap, I mean, right? this is why my point is this is so super short. Yeah. Yeah. There's again still discussion, right? So it's a very short yeah. edge problem. And it would be an easy fix if you had a better landing zone more distance. Yeah, right? exactly. You be able to stand yeah. you're done, but yeah. and so, so you can see here we take an injection. Yeah, so and there's no flow. Yeah. It's a problem. It's a problem and it doesn't help you in a way, right? Because now it, uh, you invested some dying actually. Yeah. I mean, you know there is a problem, but you don't know what the problem is still. Yeah. So let's see what we do. But that's again how we use these technologies, right? I mean, you use them to confirm or exclude something or to demonstrate something. If you, you, you need to have a differential diagnosis before you do anything. Right. And what could this be? Distal edge dissection, right. diffuse disease, or 48 millimeter stand and a lot of no reflow. highly lipidic plug, perhaps so just no reflow. Right. Right? What we're doing here is we're actually just using the saline to inject mm -hmm. as a flush through because this is how they do CT and you can see that there's no, no flow in this uh, distal vessel. So yeah. now the differential has changed a little bit. Is this uh, uh, due to plaque embolization? Is it slow flow, no mm -hmm. flow, or is it a dissection? So uh, we're gonna go through a new algorithm now. Uh, so what are the options, right? I mean, you could get, get, give some 
metagolin or 2B3A, you can give some adenosine or other nitro. So here we take, a, I think we're going to take a proper picture. Yeah. And this actually helps a little bit. Yeah. Uh, it helps a little bit because this looks like there's basically slow flow all the way down the artery and the contrast actually stops before the end of the stent. Mm -hmm. So what this told us was that maybe a little bit of drugs here, a little pharmacology can help mm -hmm. open the distal vessel. Yeah. I mean, there's no price for that, right? I mean, you can just try and see what it does. What do you give these patients? Aspirin, clopidogrel? Yeah, um, uh, you know, we, we, don't, we tend to use a lot of uh, more modern P2Y12 inhibitors. Also for the stable cases? Yeah. yeah. Do you any do, do any P2Y12 testing? We do. Often. Yeah. Very, very often, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. It's a sort of Somehow we have a hesitation to use clopidogrel in a lot of, even in stable patients. And so no. if we use it, we want to make sure they actually responders. Yeah, I mean, 20, 30 percent are non responders, right? I know, right. but the data is somewhat weak on testing in general. I know. No. But nevertheless, I mean, we do it pretty no. routinely. No. So here we're going back with the Navis. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting, right? All right, let's just equalize, equalize this. Please. But it's, it, it's also difficult to interpret, right? I mean, you have, you have no reflow per definition. Right. So the reason we did this, Yoast, was to help delineate whether we have a focal distal edge flap mm -hmm. where there would be a pressure gradient across, or if we go distally and the pressure's normal, then that excludes that. But and you so rely then we think on the non hyper non a on a high non hyperemic index. Correct. Well, there's and no, so there's no flow. So exactly. there's no flow. I agree. I agree. <laughs> so so actually that's what exactly happens here. Uh -huh. So we go down there and the PDP is 0 0.94 and on the pullback there's no edge and so that's why we went with pharmacology. But there was like no reflow at all, right? I mean this is like zero flow. You think we should balloon this a little bit? Yeah, you're discussing what to do. Pharmacology, small balloon. It also shows you how rapidly can you can do a post PCI assessment, yeah. right? So that also is helpful, even in a, you know, hairy situation like this. Mm -hmm. you, we never lose the wire. Right. Yeah. That's the beauty of the Navis, and you'll see there's actually no focal step up. <coughs> it's actually very diffuse, mm -hmm. and so that helped us made the decision that the next step should actually be pharmacology. I don't know if we did a little distal balloon dilatation, a little. Uh, you know, I, I, well, but, I think I mean, we give drugs. That would be one option also here with the diffuse disease, like you always said before, especially if you have a drug coated balloon mm. available, which currently we don't in the US. But. but here it's actually drugs. What is your first choice down here? Nitroprusside, adenosine, 2B3A, so, nitroglycerin. So uh, I think physiologically, sodium nitroprusside is our, uh, is our uh, modality of choice. It's become very difficult to get it, uh, it's become very expensive Sorry. in the US. And so here we've given cardine. Oh, what is that cardine? A cardizem. Yeah, it's like a diltizem. Ah, diltizem. Ah, like ah, a okay. calcium channel blocker. Diltizem, okay. Yeah, yeah we would routinely give adenosine in combination with a little bit of nitrates and uh, sometimes some 2B3As. Depends a little bit, I mean, if the patient is properly preloaded, specifically with modern generation P2Y12. Right. Slightly less efficacious, but. So we're just waiting something. now. You'll notice we haven't ballooned. Yeah. So um, we're basically using the combination of imaging and physiology to figure out how to deal with this problem. Mm -hmm. and give the cardine and see what we have. Yeah, and this is a perfect example of why you do these procedures staged. Right. Right, right now, we're at 9.1 mils of contrast. We still have 9 mils to use. If we had already used up our 20 or 18 from the diagnostic, now we're going into the exponential risk zone. <clears throat> So I'm going to go maybe like halfway in like this. Yeah, I think that's good. <coughs> this is the balloon, right? Mm -hmm. Small balloon. Yeah. Two oh. And when I say soft, Two I mean, yeah, mean I'm soft. I'm going to go to then four then. six. Yeah. Right. That's it. Usually when Alan says soft, I go to 18. So he's okay. reiterating to me to go soft. All right. We have Four. enough to section. We don't need to create more. <laughs> Keep that up for a little so bit. So is it too old? Actually, mark where we are distally, so we know. Mm. 
What I tend to do in these cases, I, I mean, there's a lot of up and down with the balloons, right? In contemporary PCI, people inflate a stand, and before it's up, they go down. I think in specifically in these cases, and I think you're also doing that here, you keep the balloon up a mm -hmm. little bit longer, right. like in the old days in which... Uh, Let the plaque shift a little bit. Yeah. And it's better to use longer balloons in a case like this as opposed to having multiple inflation with a shorter balloon. Good point. That's so. actually a CTO technique that we use commonly in the subintimal space and when we believe we have multiple dissections, doing the more inflations you do, the more dissections you create. Mm. So we tend to use 30 millimeter balloons to minimize our further <coughs> dissections. Yep. Or like 15 mils, please, thanks. Okay. Maybe we okay. can Ivis again the and moment see of what truth. we find yeah, here. Yeah, I'm thinking that if we don't get an answer on this injection, we'll take a microcatheter and do micro microcatheter injections. So we can see where the slow flow is. Happening. Maybe we yeah. should do that anyway. It's another option. Yeah, you guys want to get me a turnpike, uh, please. The only downside <coughs> is you're losing distal wire. Well, we'll put in another case, wire through. It. We'll leave that wire. Okay. Can I have a, actually? You know what? Um, on the t we have a Cermotics microcatheter. It's in a white box. On the CTO cart. Fine cross micro 14 or teleport. That's me trying to save money. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. All right, so New we'll York. Start with this and then I would use an over the wire balloon. Right. 10 yes, euros. We, this, we don't need the sort wire, really. Yeah, you want to just. We can just use that wire. Yeah. No, but I think it's, 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 it's a thing here because you already have the two wires. If you have a six French guide, I mean, uh, you may have issues putting I think a we third go, wire. We, go, we a typically go seven. I mean, we're going to yeah. come from the groin. We're going to close it. So in cases like this, we typically go seven French. Mm. So we're going to use a Telemark um, microcatheter from Cermotics, uh, which is basically a transit catheter. We're going to take it into the stent at the point at which we could see no flow and take an injection through the microcatheter. So that, of course, is a nice technique to be able to minimize dye. Yeah. As we're now getting closer and closer to our EGFR cutoff, mm. which we're at 10 mils, any small sort of saving has value. Once you get to an EGFR ratio of, of 1, actually 0 0.88 was our spline curve cutoff, but we just used 1 for the sake of ease, you really see a logarithmic increase in contrast-induced nephropathy and potential complication. Ah, this is a nice, nice tip. You just use a small microcatheter with a 2 3 cc syringe, dilute the contrast, and you just inject locally. Costs you one to two cc's of contrast, yep. right? And so this is us doing that here. There's no need to pacify the left main or the circumflex. Now what we're going to do is just take some contrast. And it takes some time, huh? even in New York. So there's blood coming back is a good sign. The BMW. Okay, ready? Yep. Okay, there we go. So I'm injecting carefully so there is, until this is filled. You'll notice we stay inside the stent on purpose. Okay, we're back. Well, uh, there's so what we're going to do is disconnect this, get rid of the dye. We've got a free shot in there, so we're going to take three cc's of saline. We're going to come back to the proximal edge of the stent and take another injection. And if that's okay, we are done. We are good to go. You'll notice two very important things. One, there is backflow of blood all the way backwards, and we have anterograde flow of blood. That's, uh, we'll do a final IVUS. So you see how the physiology and imaging combined helped us make clinical decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, the, last, the worst thing we could have done is just jammed a stent in. There wasn't EKG change to be like, okay, we're going to go now. Because there was a problem in the distal edge mm -hmm. that we clearly needed to rectify. And I think if we didn't, this patient probably would have been at risk for stent thrombosis. Absolutely. Gives you maybe, if anything, better pictures, right? Oh, definitely. Because we had a specific question to address. And that was, um, you know, what was the mechanism here? I think what we did categorically was prove that this was not the dissection because we put the microcat, the navis across that wire on the wire and showed that it wasn't a distal edge, there was no gradient. Right. We gave Cardi and it resolved. Um, so it was very helpful. That's it. Can you, I'm gonna click here and go live and I'm gonna start. So that's also nice, right? That the pullback speed is adjustable depending on the situation. Yeah, so the distal diffuse disease.
Yeah. Now you clearly see the vessel, right? Yeah. Right. Still diffuse disease, but calcium here eccentrically. Certainly better looking than before, right? Yeah. Now, now there is the stand and <coughs> outflow, yeah. and the stand looks good. It looks stand looks good. It looked good before also, but now the outflow is fixed, right? Uh -huh. so but you see, the stent is actually well sized, opposed, and expanded because we use multiple balloons along its length. Yeah. Obviously, in these cases, no point in measuring expansion indices. This reference is extremely small, so expansion will be 100% or higher across the stent. You hope so. <laughs> yeah, B based on the distal reference. Stent expansion and a good result. Stent looks tremendous, right? I think this is the best you guys could do. I mean, it's look nice distally, but that's sometimes what it is. And also, I mean, there were no alternative options, right? I mean, no by a lima on this, this diffusely diseased LAD no, would have not done anything. But then again, the antiplatelet therapy comes in, which yeah. is important, where you say, okay, the stent result is nice, but mm. your outflow is somewhat questionable. Yeah. If you're a clopidogrel non-responder, you have a long clopidogrel, I think it could yeah. be an issue. Yeah, fair point. And I think those are also, at least on our side, the cases in which we may prolong a little bit, a little bit of heparin or 2B3A for 18 right. hours in order to avoid any potential acute thrombotic complications. Specifically in patients in which the preloading so was... Uh, I will say this is why I don't do a 0.5 millimeter pullback. No, I did this for Yoast. I knew that Yoast <laughs> would be commenting on this, yeah. and I'm like, It'll okay, six hours. Let's, let's do this for Yoast. <laughs> let's go back to uh, 10 millimeters. Uh, you know, Yoast needs time to digest the, uh, the images. Exactly. But at least everybody now clearly saw... I mean, this is the proximal edge again, a lot of disease. A lot of disease even here. I mean, circumflex coming in. So yeah, there's the circumflex, a lot of fiber fatty yeah. plaque. Clearly see the difference now between 6 and 12 o'clock is healthy, right is the disease, soft, the pitic pluck. And here comes our circumflex wire. Uh. So. But the lumen, the lumen areas here in the proximity look very good. Mm. So even though there's a lot of plaque, I don't think Sufficient, I would yeah. say, yeah. Yeah, I don't think yeah. there is a need to do more. Yeah. We ran out of space. <laughs> we, had, we had that thing really done. And pullback length. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Okay, now the decision. Do you make a final angel? I think so. You know, when you have a complicated case, complicated lesion, and uh, it, it makes sense to do a final angiogram. Now, uh, our final angiogram, I, was I think, with the microcatheter injection for us was acceptable because we answered all the questions that we needed. Mm -hmm. But if you hadn't and you were doing more interventions, I think to not take a final angiogram in a complicated case like this where there's a complication, mm -hmm. so to speak, is, is not good practice. Yeah. No, I tend to agree, and also in light of any potential future issues, I mean, it's always good to have a final angio at the end of this case to, to refer back to in case this patient may come back to the lab for any future issues. And so one thing that you're seeing here, which is our routine practice actually, is we go back with the JR or pigtail and remeasure the end diastolic procedure. Mm. The reason is the patient's been sedated, blood pressure may drop, patient's been there for some time, I think it really helps you to determine what the EDP is because it de now details our post-procedure care. Yeah. Especially yeah. if you use contrast. Yeah. Like in this case, we use whatever 12 cc's yeah. what we use. Yeah. So, you know, if we didn't have, it, have to use anything, it would be different maybe. Yeah, and again, again, you, you can tailor the need for any, any potential need of, of, of post-PCI, uh, post-hydration. I mean, if the LVDP is okay, there's no need. In this case, the LVDP is, what is it, 15, 16? So it's worked. It came up right? a little bit. And I saw, yeah. Right? Yeah. We've been hydrating throughout the case. Mm -hmm. 250 bolus yeah. and then 125 an hour, please. Maybe that's going to be 500. No, He's going to get 125 an hour. So from 11 to 50, that's good. Yeah. Good. Okay, thanks for nice. joining us. I think that was an illustrative case of... Imaging, physiology, uh, guided, radiant. zero contrast PCI, and some troubleshooting. And a complication. Yeah. All right. Nice. Any final words of wisdom here, guys? No. I think great case. Uh, I think this is how we can do contemporary PCI in patients with renal insufficiency using current 
or contemporary imaging and physiology techniques, specifically the novice microcatheter, which is a great technology for multiple assessments, both in a pre as well as in a post PCI setting. High definition IVIS, which is critical in order to see these nitty gritty details in small vessels, diffuse disease. Uh, that's where the high definition IVIS technologies really make a difference. Uh, the pullback speed specifically, if you do a lot of pullbacks, uh, is, is, is quite handy if you can ramp that up a little bit, but still having the opportunity to tune that down in case of, of, of complex uh, specific locations. Uh, a lot of tips and tricks, uh, thanks to you guys, on how you can further minimize the contrast uh, by using a microcatheter, a rational for you going femoral in patients with uh, the potential need of, of, of uh, fistula in the future. So no, I think great case. Um, any final comments? No, I think you said it all. Great, yeah. then I would li like to thank you both. Thank you for watching and uh, all the best, bye-bye.